Welcome to another episode where we discuss the history of Yu-Gi-Oh! We last left off at the end of 2003 with the release of Dark Crisis, where we discussed the simplicity of the game in 2002 that focused on pure beatdown, and then eventually going into 2003 with the early stages of the hand control variant. The year of 2004, however, started out with a very strong start. The first set of the year, Invasion of Chaos, is known to this day as one of the most infamous sets in the entire history of Yu-Gi-Oh! Wanna know why? Stick around! Just to give you some examples of very famous cards introduced in the set, Grand Majuda Aza is one of the game's most powerful cards stat-wise if used correctly in a deck, Dark Magician of Chaos, otherwise known as Demok, is essentially a better spell card recycler than Magician of Faith, while also being a key playmaker in OTKs involving the Banish Zone. Manticore of Darkness was one of the more difficult monsters for your opponent to get rid of because it could abuse its effect with multiple copies of itself. Manju of the 10,000 Hands is one of the game's better ritual support cards. Smashing Ground is a better fissure in most cases. Dimension Fusion could lead to bullshit OTKs. Compulsory Evacuation Device, CED, was one of the game's better and more flexible trap cards for several years. And Chaos Sorcerer is basically just a nerfed version of one of the two other most devastating cards from this set, which I'll get into shortly. It's funny that I say it's a nerfed version, but it was still really, really good. Anyway, the majority of these cards found themselves on the ban list eventually in some way, shape, or form. Demok, for example, was limited from its release in 2004 until mid-2008 where it was finally forbidden from 08 until 2015 when it eventually received an errata allowing it to retrieve the spell card during the end phase instead, while also giving it a hard once per turn clause to stop OTK abuse. Manticore was semi-limited from its release in 2004 until 2008. Smashing Ground was limited from 2007 to 2009. Dimension Fusion eventually got hit on the limited list in 2007 and then was forbidden from 2008 until present day in 2020. Composer Evacuation Device was actually hit later, between the years of 2013 to 2017 where it was limited. And Chaos Sorcerer, this one has had quite a roller coaster in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh. It was forbidden from 2006 to early 2009, limited in 2009, then went to semi-limited later that year, then went back to limited in 2010, then back to semi later in 2010, and finally unlimited in 2011 for two years, but then went back to limited right before 2013, then back to semi in 2014, and it stayed semi-limited for another year and a half until 2015. Yeah, this one in particular has been really ridiculous to be honest, but it's obvious that all of these cards have seen some level of success throughout the years. Even Manju and Grand Majuda Aza, who weren't on the list, are still very good cards to this day. However, among all these cards from Invasion of Chaos, there's two very prominent ones that stood out, being Black Luster Soldier, Envoy of the Beginning, and Chaos Emperor Dragon, Envoy of the End. You see, prior to Invasion of Chaos, cards that could special summon themselves were incredibly rare effects, as special summoning in general was a pretty rare feat by this point, as I had mentioned in part 1 of the series. There were a few spirit monsters, not those kinds of spirits, that could special summon themselves from the hand by banishing specific attribute monsters from the graveyard, and a lot of them weren't bad, as they were decent beat sticks at the very least, but aside from these, this was almost a non-existent concept by this point. But these two, alongside Chaos Sorcerer, were very unique that they had this special summoning condition, and best of all, it wasn't even that difficult to achieve. These two cards had very high stats, incredibly powerful effects, and were easy to bring out. Their power was just so dominating that this led to one of the game's first tier 0 decks in history, which was known as Chaos Control, also known as Chaos Yodelock. A tier 0 deck is defined by the Yu-Gi-Oh! community as any deck that takes at least 65% of top spots in major Yu-Gi-Oh! events, and these types of decks have been so rare throughout the game's history that it just shows you how powerful and popular Chaos Control actually was. Overall though, Chaos Control was honestly just an improved variation of the previous year's hand control, as the majority of the powerful spells untrapped for this deck were almost the exact same as before. 
The main difference was of course making sure to run light and dark monsters such as Kaiko the Ghost Destroyer or Reflect Bounder and Deity Warrior Lady from Dark Crisis. Shining Angel and Mystic Tomato also worked to some extent, but not all variations of the deck ran these. All these cards obviously helped to bring out the Envoys on an easier level, while the ultimate game ending combo revolved around using Chaos Umper Dragon's effect while either Witch of the Black Forest or Sangan were on the field. By utilizing this combo, you could effectively get rid of your opponent's entire field and hand while also getting to search one monster, which should be Yada Garasu. Then summon Yada and attack, and the game is over through the Yada Lock, because your opponent has nothing on the field and nothing in the hand. That's it. Unsurprisingly, it was actually pretty easy to pull off and quite honestly didn't require that much skill to use this deck. As a fun fact for all of you watching this that have actually taken a break from Yu-Gi-Oh, Chaos Emperor Dragon is no longer on the ban list today. I know what you're thinking, what the fuck, seriously? What? Well, that's actually because it received an errata in 2014 when you can no longer activate any other effects that Trini uses effect. This makes the card incredibly slow to use effectively in combos, to the point where nobody really plays as a Rada version. For example, you can't use a Witcher Sangan effect on the same turn that you use Chaos Emperor Dragon. That's only one example, but there's plenty more. But overall, this is actually why Konami decided to remove it from the ban list completely because nobody was playing it anymore. Talk about making one of the game's most powerful and iconic cards a complete joke, huh? Well, erratas happen, and I have my own opinions about that, but that's definitely going to be for a future video. So as the year went on, more sets were released, being Ancient Sanctuary, Soul of the Duelist, and Rise of Destiny, but to be perfectly honest, it wasn't a big deal, as there was nothing released for the majority of 2004 that could compete with Chaos Control. Sure, there were some individually powerful cards from each set, such as Enemy Controller, or the introduction of the Monarchs, but there was no complete deck that could rival the current meta. However, in October of 2004, it finally happened. Salomon Greats arrived. Just kidding, it was actually Yu-Gi-Oh's first ever Forbidden List. Once again, remember that by this point, all that was done to limit the power of powerful cards was to place them on the semi-limited or limited list, but there were no Forbidden cards in the game. But this new list changed everything. There were 13 cards on this ban list, with many of them being powerful staples that could basically work on any deck. But to stop Chaos Control specifically, the four monsters that were hit were perhaps the most noteworthy. The key cards used for the infamous combo I mentioned previously were now all forbidden, so you're probably thinking, oh, so that's it for Chaos decks, right? Actually, no, not quite. You see, Chaos Emperor Dragon being banned was perhaps the best thing that could have happened to Black Luster Soldier, Envoy of the Beginning, as it was previously known as the second in command to Envoy of the End, but with its ban, BLS became the new ace boss monster of the new Chaos deck. So yes, Chaos decks were still prominent for the remainder of 2004 and the beginning of 2005 by using BLS in combination with powerful hand control cards and the popular Magical Scientist. However, in spring of 2005, the second ban list hit. And this is the ban list that hit the last several broken cards, the Forceful Sentry, Confiscation, Painful Choice, Fiber Jar, and Magical Scientist were now officially forbidden. But some cards, strangely enough, like Delinquent Duo and Sangan, were removed from the Forbidden list. Ultimately, that wasn't a huge deal, but it was a pretty interesting move there. But overall, this was the ban list that maneuvered the game to begin the very iconic GOAT format. Also known as the Tom Brady format. The Brady format lasted for an entirety of 6 months from April to September of 2005. The majority of the community agrees that this specific format is one of the more skill-based formats in Yu-Gi-Oh's entire history, while many argue that it's also the most fun format. While they're both opinions, I can definitely see the quote most fun comment being much more subjective, as the format might not be for everyone, but the quote most skillful comment having a lot more truth behind it. You see, the entire premise of the format required players to maximize card value during specific times and turns in order to generate a win, a feat that was incredibly difficult to perfect. The skill factor of modern Yu-Gi-Oh, however, is essentially memorizing long lines of play. In other words, summon what first, to special summon X, to special summon Y, then activate the spell card to special summon Z, and so on and so forth. Goat format had a much less emphasis on memorizing long lines of play, as that was pretty much non-existent during this time but instead it focused on getting the best out of your current cards as they get used, as you couldn't burn through half your deck in a single turn like modern Yu-Gi-Oh, and this format was even slower than the previous Chaos Control dominance mainly because the majority of the powerful broken cards got forbidden. 
There were a few decks that ruled GOAT format, such as Flip Control decks, Zombie Chaos, Machine Beatdown, and Monarchs. But the most prominent was GOAT Control, which inspired the GOAT format name, of course. Despite GOAT Control being the most prominent though, it was by no means the sole dominating force like what Chaos Control did in the previous format, as one of the most beloved elements of GOAT format was that there was so much flexibility on what a player could do to try and create the most strategically powerful deck. Archetypes didn't rule Yu-Gi-Oh like nowadays, and in many cases, player skill was more of a deciding factor in the outcome of a duel, and much less on what your starting hand was or if you went first or second. Go Control focused on utilizing Scapegoat with Metamorphosis in order to generate Thousand Eyes Restrict to maintain fuel control. Zombie Chaos utilized cards like Vampire Lord, Book of Life, Pyramid Turtle, and Spirit Reaper in combination with typical Chaos cards to generate advantage. Flip Control capitalized on Tsukuyomi and Book of Moon's powerful effects to recycle Night Assailant, Morphing Jar, and Death's Lakuta. The former of which was an anti-hand control card, as it could bypass effects like Delinquent Duo, Spirit Reaper, or Donza Lug. Monarchs used, well, Monarchs. Their tributes to them and powerful effects don't exactly need an explanation, but there were powerful recyclers then, such as Sinister Serpent. And cards like these is exactly what made Monarchs stay in the competition. And lastly, Machine Beatdown was at its early stages of what was soon to come, but it still performed well during this format because limited removal was unlimited, allowing for powerful OTKs every now and then. However, during September 2005, GOAT format officially ended. The first reason was because of the next ban list. September's ban list included the complete ban of Sinister Serpent, Graceful Charity, Delinquent Duo, and finally, BLS. That's right, this card finally got forbidden. In addition to these bans, Scapegoat, Metamorphosis, Thousand Eyes Restrict, Night Assailant, Tsukuyomi, Book of Moon, and Limited Removal all got limited, thus significantly slowing down the strategies of all these decks and making them much more inconsistent. The second reason for GOAT format's end was because of the release of one card from Cybernetic Revolution that would eventually change the game forever, Cyber Dragon. Cyber Dragon was released in August 2005 and little did we know that its effect was essentially perhaps the most inspiring card design ever for modern Yu-Gi-Oh! You see, the card effectively changed the way players would approach their first turn rather than just a pure straight out summon, or else they would only be pulverized by this thing the following turn, and so it also generated you advantage for going second. However, if you look at its effect on a deeper level, you should see a significant amount of resemblance to most main deck monsters with special summoning conditions in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! For example, let me translate it for you. If you have field disadvantage, you can special summon this card from your hand. That's basically what it translates to. Knowing that context, if you take a look at many monsters nowadays, you'll see something almost identical. If your opponent controls more monsters than you, bam, special summon. If you control no monsters, bam, special summon. If you control no back row, bam, special summon. If there's X many monsters on the field, bam, special summon. Noticing an inspiring trend here? I could keep going and going, but I'd be here all day. But yes, it's true that this kind of shit started back in 2005. Obviously on a much more simplistic level, but even then, Cyber Dragon made a huge impact on the metagame, as the only other card that had an effect similar to Cyber Dragon before this was the Fiend Mega Cyber. And while that card is not bad by any means, it's no Cyber Dragon, nor is it the same special summoning condition as many modern Yu-Gi-Oh cards as well. But with Cyber Dragon allowing you to bypass tribute summoning in order to get a high attack monster on the field while not even making you use your normal summon, was the first of several steps that caused the game to speed up on a ridiculous level eventually. And that's basically where 2005 leaves off, as Elemental Energy didn't really provide key game-changing cards. Sure, it introduced iconic cover cards like Shining Flare Wingman, but nothing noteworthy. But overall, we definitely did start to witness a slightly different approach from players that required more aggressive tactics and planning rather than just a simple set one monster, set one back row, I end my turn. This new playstyle would overall be translated for the next couple years, but that's gonna be for the next video. Wanna know more about the history of Yu-Gi-Oh's timeline and formats? Like and subscribe to stay tuned for the next episode.